So hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us for another GitOps Days community special. My name is Stacy Potter. I'm a community manager here at Weaveworks. And today I'm joined yet again by my wonderful teammate, Lee Kapili, uh, who is a developer experience engineer uh, who will be walking us through today uh, and demoing the Flux guide on migrating from Flux V1 to Flux V2. So if you've joined us in the past few weeks or months, you know that we've been doing these talks every two weeks or so, thanks to Lee and a couple of other folks, but mainly the lion's share has been on Lee, um, mainly for the Flux community. So if you're a Flux user, you know we really appreciate that you're part of the community and hopefully uh, you know that the team's been heads down working on this new re revamp of Flux V2, which uh, Lee's gonna be you know diving into today on showing us how to migrate. Um, so a lot of these talks have been focused on really giving you guys more sneak peeks um, to the ca powerful capabilities of, of Flux 2 and what it's really going to do for you. Um, so stay tuned and there's more to come. Um, a quick note on getting connected uh, with the Flux community. So if you get stuck or if you need help, um, please make sure you check out the docs. Uh, there's a link there and uh, GitHub discussions Q&A section uh, under the, the Flux2 repo is a great place uh, to find, you know, questions and answers to anything that you might be looking for there as well. Um, team's been really hard at work trying to put stuff there so that you have resources. Um, and of course, you can always find us on the CNCF Slack channel Flux. So just a quick little bit about the company that Lee and I work for. We are called Weaveworks. Hopefully if you know us, you know, uh, you know us from all the open source work that we do. Um, of course, today we're featuring Flux, which is in the CNCF sandbox right now. Um, hopefully we've submitted for incubating status and hopefully we'll be getting that soon, but fingers crossed, we're still waiting to hear. Um, and Flagger is also now uh, part of the Flux project uh, under the CNCF. So um, one thing to note about that too is um, there's a new Flux, uh, or sorry, Flagger channel in the CNCF Slack. So you can you can uh, find that there. We're kind of migrating folks over from when the Flagger project was uh, under the WeaveWorks umbrella. So you can find the Flagger um, Slack channel under the CNCF Slack now. Um, more projects here that are listed. If you want to check them out, please go to our website, weave.works or our GitHub repo. Quick note uh, on Zoom. I'm sure everybody's familiar with this already, but um, we are using Zoom, of course. Uh, and if you have any uh, questions at any time, please type them into the chat. And if you could just change the two from panelists and attendees to, uh, I'm sorry, from just panelists, because it'll just go to me and Lee, um, to panelists and attendees. That way everybody can see your question. Otherwise, I'll just be copying and pasting them um, into the chat there. Uh, and if you're new to GitOps, we're just going to give you a quick basic run through. Um, so as the name indicates, it's Git plus ops, or sometimes we like to say operations by pull, requ pull request, where you have a repo as your single source of truth. Uh, it's not just app or dev or just operations, um, but really a methodology uh, that crosses all areas. We talk about GitOpsing all the things and the business value that comes with that are reliability, velocity, and security benefits. Um, it's also a paradigm or a methodology. It's one, not one single tool or technology. Uh, of course, we're very excited about our Flux project and we work really hard to get it to this place where we've really brought GitOps a value, but we're thinking about the vision of the most powerful way we can think about GitOps in the coming years and hopefully decades. Um, we really do feel that even if you're not using Kubernetes, you can still do GitOps. Uh, but if you are using Kubernetes, it's really part of the evolution of Kubernetes, leveraging the Kubernetes API and what that brings and really is the next stage and way of leveraging the benefits of that technology. And we're excited to be part of that community in a very deep way. Uh, you can also check out our YouTube channel for more information on what is GitOps, some sort of introductory talks and things like that. So um, I'll paste that in the chat in just a few minutes. 
And so the principles of GitOps, I'm going to run through these very quickly, so this will be very bare bones, but so not everybody has all four of these principles. So really anywhere you start is a great way to get started on your GitOps journey, whether you're using Git as your versioning system or not. The important thing is that you're using a versioning system. Uh, other core principles are that you have a declarative system, uh, that you have a way in which changes are automatically applied to that system. And then at the end, you have ways of reconciling and ensuring that you have correctness um, and alerts with that as well. Um, so that's very quick and dirty overview of the principles of GitOps. Um, and like I said, if you're interested in learning more, uh, we have tons of talks on our YouTube channel. You can check those out um, also from our previous GitOps days. Um, so with that, I think, yeah, it's demo time. So Lee, I will stop my share and turn it over to you. Awesome. Thanks, Stacey. Yeah, just to add it like a little bit more color to I'm really glad uh, that every time we do uh, these get togethers with the flux community. Uh, and if you're new here, welcome. Um, lots of folks have been doing GitOps uh, for quite a long time. And today, uh, this talk is for those flux one users. Um, but GitOps is uh, definitely something that is picking up more steam in the community. Lots of veterans, lots of very senior level folks who have uh, very deep experience with Kubernetes uh, who don't yet uh, have the full vision of what GitOps can bring to the table and why it's important. Uh, when we talk about GitOps in the context of Flux and Kubernetes, uh, there are a couple of things to really just remember. And that is that Kubernetes, it doesn't version your objects in a way that is humanly consumable. Uh, and so when you are iterating on your distributed computer with your teammates, your friends, the people who you are delivering your organizational mission with, right, you providing a service or something, um, then collaborating on the declarations that make your infrastructure work, having comments, ordering your fields, like storing which fields were supplied and which were not when you want to do an API version upgrade, all those things, they're not possible with only Kubernetes. Right, like Kubernetes, that's not in scope for the project. And so GitOps, it takes those missing pieces and it takes ownership of them, right? There's there's other things like access control and the fact that lots of devs already know how to use Git, you know, which is why we kind of focus on the Git part, but you could use Subversion or Perforce or uh, Google Sheets, you know, we had to talk about that. Um, so just some things to keep in note. Um, if you haven't thought a lot about why GitOps is magic, um, we have a lot of opinions and we try to include that when we cover our material. Now, today, I am happy uh, to share with all of you a few considerations about moving from Flux version one to version two. And uh, I put together a little presentation, not always uh, doing slides, but today I have slides for you friends uh, instead of just a live demo. Uh, now we have a demo and more. So uh, I'll share my screen here. Let's see, it's this one. And let's pull those up. We got, got Flux 1 to Flux 2 considerations. Uh, this is important, and we've got a huge section of our documentation. If you actually go to Toolkit Flux CDIO right here, uh, excuse my dark mode, this website will probably look different for you. But uh, right here in the sidebar, uh, or if you're on mobile, then you just go to the hamburger section over here. You can click on migration. And we've got a section for migrating from Flux V1. We also have a section about migrating from the Helm operator. Uh, because now we have a new Helm controller in Flux 2. And we have uh, some notes about migrating for image update automation, which is one of the most beloved features of Flux 1. Uh, we've broke down into some smaller pieces so that you can have more granular control. And that is a theme uh, that runs throughout all of uh, your migration considerations when you're going from V1 to V2. Um, we have a massive community of folks out there who are running Flux 1 on the clusters, whether you're looking at the uh, image pull metrics from Docker Hub uh, or just seeing the amount of talks, seeing all of the end users at KubeCon and GitOps stays, uh, there is a huge number of you using Flux 1 in lots of different ways. Some of you are using a single Flux in one cluster. Some of you are using hundreds of Flux Ds 
in multiple clusters in your organization uh, because you have a wide and deep use case there or you're doing multi-tenancy. Uh, and so it's really important to us to, uh, with the community, team up and build a proper migration story because we have iterated on so many of those ideas as a consequence of all of the best practices that have been developed over the years with Flux V1. So Flux 2, why would you do it, right? Why would you even go through the pain? Uh, and there are a lot of benefits. Um, some of these are things that you already had when you were using Helm Operator. Things like declarative Helm aren't an obvious benefit in terms of migration. But I will say that with declarative Helm comes a bunch of other benefits that you get. For instance, with dependency and ordering, um, our Helm release object in V2 has a dependency feature. Similarly, we have a customization object uh, that can also do dependent ordering. Uh, we've also got health checks in there. You can compose multiple repos with a single installation of Flux now. Uh, and that's an important concept that gets back into dependency resolution. Uh, you're getting constant reconciliation, which is something that we're all used to, but you no longer with dependencies have to be worried about doing that, setting that up, bootstrapping it in the proper way. Uh, you get multi-tenancy now, right? So we are working on an even stronger model, but currently Flux2 is already capable of splitting up RBAC between multiple teams, uh, having kind of granular levels of concern uh, through the service account, as well as remote cluster management features. There's clear boundaries. Uh, you can create you know, much more cohesive uh, organizational structures as you implement GitOps, not only within your technology, but with your culture. You know, all of this is auditable. You know, you get all of those additional benefits wrapped up in the GitOps stuff that we're used to. Um, we've got uh, individual policies now as well for handling image tags and things like that. So it's just, just like a little compilation of things that you should begin to look at. Uh, Flux2 is much more broken down. You can actuate every piece of your GitOps approach using each one of our APIs or extension mechanisms. Um, it, I would say that Flux2 is more Kubernetes native. Yeah. Um, the trade-off I think is that there is a little bit more complexity that you may be willing to take on. Uh, and that's why our documentation story is 10 times better than it used to be. So, so today's scope is just about sources being fetched into the cluster. Uh, and then the reconciliation of those sources. Uh, and at first you would think, okay, well, that seems a little bit simple. Uh, and in Flux1, we did keep it simple. Flux1, you deploy it into your cluster. It's just a single deployment, right? And then you configure that deployment with some command line flags on Flux image. And there you go, right? It goes in and pulls down your repository from the URL that you specify, from the branch that you specify, and from the path that you give it. There are a bunch of other options, actually. Um, so, I mean, I don't, I don't want to just like feign, you know, uh, simplicity. Uh, if you look at the uh, Flux V1 config, let's see where it is. Flux VIO, and then into. Sorry, I should have had this up. I, I was looking at that thing earlier. Is it in? It's not in community. It's under project inside of, this is supposed to be docs, flex one docs. Yep, here we go. And then we have references for the daemon. Here we go. So the daemon that lives inside your cluster, right? I was talking about the URL path uh, and branch flags. Uh, but you've got all kinds of other configuration in here because every concern that you had about configuring uh, Flux for the single repository you were interested in reconciling uh, was done in this single data. And then if you, say, wanted to have something more complicated, like, say, syncing from multiple repositories, right, because you had some separation of concerns in your organization, say, two teams who each had their own application and they wanted separate repos to do their config, then what you would do is you would install Flux into each namespace for each of those teams, right? Or in each cluster or however the division was done. And um, then each of those teams would just manage their config with the flags and it was no big deal. You know, you just had lots of uh, Flux installations. Now, 
the thing that uh, was a little awkward here is uh, that you had to run Flux in a pod in every single namespace for every single repository that you were interested in reconciling. And when you got to large clusters, it it had some scaling issues uh, where you know there was just a little bit of overhead, and then you had to have people managing these deployments. Upgrading Flux was also a per team issue. And um, so, you know, those are things that you could do, uh, but it was just a trade-off in that single deployment design. And so in the V2 config, what we've done is we've allowed you to deploy Flux at the cluster level by default, if you want. Uh, you can still deploy Flux in a single namespace uh, with the exception that custom resource definitions are not namespaceable. But now that we've got custom resources and an API to describe how we want to actuate and configure our behavior in relation to the way that we're implementing GitOps in our organization, then we can split up the concerns of how we pull sources into the cluster and how we reconcile them. And you'll notice I said sources, not just Git repos, uh, because in addition to Git repos, we now also support uh, first class in Flux a Helm repository definition and a bucket. Flux is now capable using a component called source controller to fetch those things into the cluster first. And then based off of how we want to configure the reconcilers, be it customizations or Helm releases, and customizations are what we use for the plain manifests if you're worried about that, then um, you can get granular control of say, syncing multiple directories creating health checks on certain directories, and then doing dependency management. You can make a Helm release dependent on your network policy infrastructure being deployed first. Right? And so that kind of stuff just wasn't possible before because the control wasn't granular yet. You had to do things like uh, create a job that would deploy Flux into a child namespace. Right? And since you're no longer deploying Flux in order to get these things to actually map out to control the reconciliation, things are working. Uh, there's other improvements uh, and fun UX uh, kind of niceties that I will be done. So um, just mapping a little bit of those old flags now, you'll notice, right, before these things used to just be configured on the daemon inside of flags instead of a deployment. Uh, but now that we've decoupled deployment and we've decoupled the ideas, those two flags, you'll be concerned about mapping them to sources, the branches and the URLs, right? and the reconcilers can actually point to specific paths. So like I could say, create four customizations that point to one source. So that V2 config then, now we've got say our flux system installation, uh, and then we bootstrap our first repository into the cluster and we have a source and a reconciler, be it a Git repository and a customization. And in that multi namespace example, we install Flux once. And then say team A, you know, on the top, they have their one Git repo. And then they can reconcile a bunch of uh, different paths in that Git repo separately using that same installation across the cluster. And in team B's namespace, they could even sync to a completely different source from a different provider, say GitLab or their own internally hosted Git T or Bitbucket. And they can have their own reconciler config without having to reinstall the entire Flux system. So the platform administrator can manage Flux system for a cluster or a fleet of clusters. And then all of the teams uh, who have namespaces in those clusters can then own their own configuration. And you no longer have that administrator burden of controlling like which paths are reconciled and who they're dependent on. Uh, we have some questions coming in uh, with regard to, it seems like, so Subramani wants to know, um, it'd, be, it'd be nice if we could talk about the minimum access needed uh, for service accounts uh, and API groups and resources. Uh, the service account concern is done with the reconciler configuration in Flux 2. Uh, previously, you would, on a single installation of Flux, you'd have that service account fill. Um, if you are in a migration scenario, uh, then you already have these RBAC splits configured, and then you can just point the reconciler to the proper SA. Um, and then 
Um, as far as uh, being able to use the same configuration for Flux 1 versus Flux 2, they are fundamentally different. Uh, but I'm going to show uh, which pieces of config, um, mainly the Kubernetes objects that actually live in your repo, those things can be reused. Uh, we're going to migrate from the same exact repos in the demo today. Uh, but there's some additional things that you need to point uh, Flux 2 at since we are no longer using the Flux D daemon. So that's a difference there. Um, cool. And lots of other questions. Cool. We'll move on. So, so the multi source migration, then, uh, which is going to be one of the more kind of complex use cases. Like, if you've just got a single repo, you just use Flux Bootstrap in Flux 2, and you're pretty good to go. Um, just turn off Flux 1, turn on Flux 2. No worries there. Uh, but uh, if you start to use some of the more advanced features, like in Flux 1, we had an experimental feature called manifest generation. Uh, and depending on what you were doing with that, you might want to go certain ways. Um, some of them would be supported inside of Flux. Some of them would be outside of Flux and CI. Uh, if you're working with multiple sources, which is very common uh, in like larger organizations with multiple dev teams uh, where GitOps and Flux really shine, uh, then it would look a little bit like this, right? We break down the config so that you no longer need to install Flux multiple times. You just install Flux into the Flux system. If you want to bootstrap a repo there, you put the source in the reconciler. And then in each of the other namespaces where you want to pull in some source, you can fetch that source in with the source config and you can reconcile it using a reconciler config, be it a Helm repository and a Helm release or a Git repository and a customization. We also support buckets if you have that kind of config in your CI. So, so in our demo today, we're going to be doing a little bit of Flux Bootstrap. Uh, I'm going to be using Flux Bootstrap to create a control repository for something that was otherwise a little bit formless, uh, where we had multiple installs of Flux that were super independent. Uh, I want to show how you can take independent installs of Flux 1 and as a platform administrator, uh, use Bootstrap to get a cluster wide view of how that is working. Uh, we're going to use flux create source git. Uh, and the reason why I want to show this is because there's in, in each of these commands some UX considerations that were previously quite painful. And then we have a flux export command uh, for making sure that whenever you modify the cluster, you also take those modifications and commit them back to git. So uh, what I've got here. Uh, how can I do this? We'll just minimize that for now. Cool. So what I've got today is a um, a K3S cluster, right? A single node K3S cluster. It's just the default one when you do K3S cluster create. Uh, you could use this with kind as well. It's not K3S specific, but I just decided to change my demo tool today. Um, and what we have are two installations of Flux, right? So there's two pods here. Uh, they come from, let's look at all the, deploy, all the deploys. Uh, there's two Flux deployments here, the memcached uh, instances that are used to look at all of the images in the cluster. This is Flux V1. And we have an install of Flux for Team B and Team A. And then those Flux installs, so like say we were to describe the deploy uh, called uh, Flux inside of the Team A namespace. Uh, we can see here the flags, and that's hooked up to a repo called Team A on my GitHub org. Uh, it's syncing the master branch, and this particular path is .config. And then if we describe Team B's flux, they have a different config. Um, they're actually using manifest generation, so inside their repo, I'll expect to see a flux YAML. Uh, and then they are pointed to their own repository, uh, on the master branch, since these are old repos, they're not main, they're master. And uh, their path is called staging. Right? So uh, this must be the staging cluster for Team B. Cool. So 
again, what I did there is I just, I looked at the deploys in the cluster. We just looked for flux. We can see the team A and team B were both, they both have some install of flux, right? So as the platform administrator, I'm thinking, okay, how can I configure flux for team A and team B so that they can move over? And then I looked at the deploys, I look at the flags to see where are those fluxes pointing to. So the next thing I'm going to do as the administrator is to go into my GitHub and I can see, okay, well, here's team A's repo. And I can see, you know, all of their code. You can see here's their config directory. They've got a deploy of their app with a deployment and a service. Similarly, team B has got their deploy key. And their repo is more complicated because they're using manifest generation. All right. So here we've got a flux YAML. If I look inside of the Flux YAML, I can see this team is using Customize. Um, this is actually just forked from our uh, archived example of Flux One. Uh, this team's using Customize uh, for every recursive directory inside of the repo. So production and staging will use that Flux YAML as long as they're not overridden. And uh, cool, right? So a bunch of Flux One stuff. Here's the patch where um, Flux One would include like an image update or something like that. And some of these interfaces now, uh, they're either deprecated or they changed in Flux 2 uh, to be more Kubernetes native uh, so that you can actually introspect the state of what is happening inside of the cluster. And uh, oh, we've got a base here for their application. So I would assume that these things extend the base. Right? So how do I then uh, get some control of this process? Right. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to scale down uh, the deployments. Um, I'm going to set replicas to zero uh, for the team A namespace on Flux. Okay. And then same thing for team B, I'll stop their reconciliation. Now, you'll notice I could have done this one at a time. right? So I could have left team B's stuff in place and left team A's. Uh, you know, Actually, we'll just do that. We'll just work on team A for the first, at first. Um, so what I'll do is using, is Flux One's command line tool is called Flux CTL. And uh, so for instance, like you could view the identity of, um, you know, a particular Flux forward namespace team A. Is this just like NS, I think? I don't know how to type. Flux CTL is a word with endless TA identity. Now my friends. Yeah. Oh, it's abbreviated. So using the, the flux one command line, uh, you're able to view like the public key for, wow, I really using the following selectors and the right cluster. Yeah, I guess. Oh yeah, I scaled team A down. That, that makes sense. So I, there we go. <laughs> So like Flux 1's command line tool is called Flux CTL and uh, Flux 2's command line tool uh, is called Flux. Uh, currently we're, we're pre-GA, so we're on the uh, Sember uh, version zero, right? But uh, this is Flux 2's command line tool. Uh, you can see that we've got a bootstrap command. We can check if the cluster is ready uh, for Flux and that kind of thing. You can look for prerequisites and stuff like that. Uh, you can print the install manifest if you want to do something more declarative. You can export resources, create them, delete them um, in a nice way. And so I'm going to do a bootstrap and we will create a migration repo. So I don't have a repo yet, uh, but I can, using the Flux Bootstrap command line tool, if I just give it access to a personal access token that can manage repositories in my personal 
uh, orc, then I can ensure that one exists. So flux bootstrap is an item potent command. Uh, you've seen this probably demoed before if you've jumped in here. Let's just make a repository and uh, we'll call this, you know, org flux2. Right. And uh, I'll say flux2 control. This will be in my personal GitHub repo and we will configure this to be, you know, config cluster zero. That looks pretty good to me. Maybe I'll give myself a little extra directory depth here. Uh, all the flux stuff will go into slash flux. So this connects up to GitHub. It makes a repo for me since it noticed that it didn't exist. Uh, temporary clones the repo down, generates some manifests for the flux installation. So previously, this is stuff that you would have to do like individual steps as the administrator when you're installing flux. Uh, but here we want to bootstrap a control repo for flux2 to get some actuation of the cluster. Uh, this is going to have cluster admin permissions over everything, uh, but you could restrict that if you would like. And uh, here it's verifying the install. So if we uh, look at kind of what's happening, uh, you can see that we have a new Flux system namespace with some, which a bunch of controllers that are running. Uh, they've been up for a few seconds. Uh, here it says that the install is completed. Now what's going to happen is it's uh, verifying that our new repository that's been created is pulled to the cluster and is constantly applying uh, so that from the end of Bootstrap, we know that GitOps is enabled. And from this point on, uh, we should be able to do most steps without modifying the cluster because we can commit manifest directly to our Bootstrap repo. Uh, now, what I'm going to use the Bootstrap repo for in the context of migration, I didn't have to scroll down there. Cool. Um, here we see, yeah. So the manifests were pushed for the sync. Everything's configured. It's finished. I'm going to use the Bootstrap repo to configure Flux for our other repositories, right? So we're showing a multi-source, multi-sync, like with multiple reconcilers uh, example. And we should have a new repo um, called uh, org flux2 control. I think, yeah, this is a private repo. I think the other two might be public. Cool. So here we see our configuration directory. We've got an install of our toolkit components. Uh, the GitOps toolkit is just the pieces that make up Flux2. Uh, and then we've got this synchronization YAML. Here we've got a Kubernetes resource that goes into the cluster that says, hey, would you please fetch this repository for me and call it this? So that's the Flux system source. And then the customization applies a path inside of that source. So haven't seen that before. Uh, we can also then say like flux get sources get. So here we say, this is actually talking to the cluster. It's looking at that Git repository object, the flux system one that's, that just comes from our repository right here. And it says, okay, well, we fetched some commit from that repo. So let's go ahead and pull that control repo down. Stealthy box, more accurately, I guess this is a hub. Or flux to control. Cool. So then we can go into org flux to control. We can get into a little bit of the deeper path, particularly for this cluster. So if I put anything into this folder right here, it's going to show up in my cluster quite quickly. Um, GitOps, right? And since we have APIs inside of the cluster, if you actually look at the CRDs and grep for flux, uh, we have the ability to create Git repository sources or Helm repositories, and we can create other reconcilers, right? Like Helm releases and customizations. And so we have all these APIs available to us, which means that we can use our bootstrap repo to configure other sources and other reconcilers. Right? So I'm going to then uh, say I turned off team A, right? Uh, if we look at uh, team A no longer has a flux pod. 
I, I scaled it down to zero because I'm in the process of migrating team A stuff over. Well, then I would say, describe the deploy for team A, uh, the flux deploy. Right. Ooh, this group need to describe the deployment, not get. There we go. So we've got these kind of configuration options. This is the particular repository that we're interested in in fetching on master. And then the customization is going to apply to this path right here. So let's go ahead and see how can we do that. I promised you that I would deploy or that I would demo flux create source. So flux create source git. Uh, if we just look at the help doc for this, we can see, oh, okay, we can specify a git URL, a branch. We can specify an algorithm for the SSH keys that we want to be generating for this thing. It's possible to reuse that secret. Um, but there's just a little bit of additional metadata uh, when you look at a flux one secret versus a flux two secret. So we'll go ahead and uh, just make sure that those things match. And um, we also want to make sure that team, well, team A and team B already have a namespace so that we don't have to make them. So let's go ahead and just set the namespace to team A. Uh, the URL is going to be from here. Notice this is a valid SSH URL. It's not using the SCP syntax. So it actually has a full protocol and all of that. Um, so nothing's changed there from flux one to flux two. Uh, we want the branch to be master. And we don't have to be concerned about the path or anything at the moment. Now, when I, oh, source name is required. We'll call this team A. Uh, Cool. So when I ran flux create source git, uh, this is saying, okay, well, let me generate a deploy key pair for you, right? If you wanted to reuse the deploy key, you could specify a secret ref here. Um, but I want the public key and a known hosts to be generated as well for these things. Uh, so I'm just going to use flux two's features, uh, which means that I can just go to the team a repo, you know, we'll do the normal thing that we typically would do to set up flux one. Uh, which is go to the deploy keys, add a deploy key, pop that in there. I'm not going to need write access for this one, but you could turn that on if you want. And there you go. You say, okay, well, I added it to the repo. It says, yes, like, let's get the public key data from the SSH server. And um, then we apply the secret that has that key. It configures the authentication on the Git repo source. Uh, and then it also checks that the reconciliation for that Git repository actually succeeds, right? So it says here, it fetched a revision from my team A, right? The most recent revision is A11F1, and that probably matches, right? A11F1, yep. So cool, there we added a source uh, to the cluster. Now we did that by just modifying the cluster. Uh, so for me, since I'm a GitOps uh, affinity kind of admin person, then I would also export that source into my cluster. All right, so I want to export source Git. Um, and this one is called team app. And it's in the namespace team A. Cool. So there's the actual repository config that got applied to the cluster as part of that bootstrapping process for the particular repo. Uh, I got authentication and a deploy key set up. And now I can actually commit this to my control repo, right? So I could say like team a app uh, git repo dot yeah. Add net, right? Configure team A uh, source. That's just my GPG signature right there. So if I push that up, uh, then in my control repo, the fact that team A's Git repository should be synced to the cluster, it isn't just some artifact of some random deployment that's living there. It's actually inside my control repo. I can look and see. Oh, okay, like for this particular organization inside of cluster zero. Um, oh, I put it into the flux directory, I guess. 
then uh, there is a Git rep repository that's going to be fetched to the cluster. Now, this isn't sufficient to do anything, right? It's not actually reconciling, it's just fetching the source. So we actually have to create a customization um, and we can get more granular kind of control of uh, what's being synchronized. We can see here that all of our config is actually in a folder called config. So let's go ahead and tell Flux to synchronize that. Uh, that would be Flux create customization. And then we need to hook it up to a particular source. Uh, this source is called Team A app. Uh, we'll just name it it's the same thing. Uh, and then it has a path that will be big. Just keeping track of some of those questions here. Oh, I put it into the wrong place. That was silly. Actually make one of those. Yeah, we'll just delete the customization for that. App in the box system. There we go. To remember to put it into the proper namespace team name. So then we can say here, okay, well, like we applied the customization, we can see that the reconciliation is successful. So let's go ahead and just export that thing again. Team app, instead of creating, we'll export it. Looks like good config to me, right? We have a customization, it's called this, it's in this namespace. Every minute, it's gonna make sure to apply this config to the cluster. And you notice I could actually back down this since like, say I don't wanna be applying my to my API server like all of the time, but I just wanna make sure that the source is up to date. I have separate sync loops for fetching the source and for applying the source. Uh, so this one can, instead of the Git repo, we'll have, uh, this QB custom uh, lines reconcile. So here I'm just adding that file. We'll do a similar config, um, which is reconcile the app. Push that up to our control repo. And now we've stored how we actually want to reconcile that thing in our control repo. You know, similarly, I could you know, modify uh, this reconciliation so that the manifests are only applied, you know, every 60 minutes instead. And then that would control how fast configuration drift is dealt with inside of the cluster versus just keeping up to date uh, with uh, like the, you know, if we look at the Git repo, the interval could be faster than actually applying the thing. And that's that fourth uh, point that Stacy was talking about in the principles of GitOps, which is that having something inside of the cluster that's actively reconciling your declarations, uh, it is important for dealing with things like like a configuration drift. Uh, nobody can just go into this cluster and just start editing things. Um, similarly, uh, on the concern of access and RBAC, is you don't necessarily need to give everybody edit access to the cluster as long as they have access to the Git repository now. Um, so like if somebody wanted to um, have some self-service access, right? Like say team B wants to come in here and manage their, the way that their sources fetch into the cluster, they wanna move their repo, you know, then they can go into their uh, repo and then, you know, change the name of it and that kind of thing. Uh, and they could send you a PR and, you know, you just review the change to your infrastructure instead of having to do things for them all the time. Uh, so ideally, this kind of control repo approach plus the strength of our documentation helps in your migration as you work with multiple teams. Um, Gerard, good question. Uh, this is kind of just an aside, but can Flux2 uh, sign commits that it makes um, like V1? 
And the answer is yes. Um, specifically, V2 can do GPG signature verification of your commits. Uh, that is something that's possible. Um, and Adam Sussman, uh, you're talking about how do things need to actually be inside of the Flux system namespace uh, or in their own namespace, uh, image related CRDs specifically. And um, basically, everything can live in its own namespace. Uh, and this will be improved as we uh, ratify the multi tenancy approach. So uh, just go ahead and take a look at those things. But yeah, each each one of the custom resources can live in their own namespace. It gets a little bit weirder uh, when you're talking about, uh, like, say, an image customization, like the image update automation referencing uh, a source in a different namespace. And that's why we uh, have some improvements coming down the line uh, for multi-tenancy. Uh, because it's just like, how do you restrict the controller from being able to have access to everything, you know, and then having cross namespace references be safe. Uh, so, but yeah, as, as far as things being able to live in their own namespace or other namespaces, like you can see that um, if we look at the customization, um inside of the cluster for you know i put that reconciler for team a's application into the team a namespace and that works just fine uh the source for this happens to also be in the same namespace which is a little bit of an important detail um, so like we're not doing any cross namespace stuff there right those things live in the same namespace so it's easy for them to reference each other in a safe way um, Supermani wants to know, uh, does V2 also look up image repositories, even if one is not using any image sync? And the answer is no, we have removed that very harmful behavior, uh, particularly as the landscape of image registries has changed. Um, we no longer have flux just like battering every single image repository that's referenced inside your cluster. This is now opt-in behavior. Uh, the alpha or the API that's used to do this is called the image policy API. Uh, and it's currently in alpha in Flux. I do have a slide on this uh, with a link to the guide. Um, you know, if we just kind of pull that up. I was going to talk about Helm, Helm operator to Helm controller migrations, which is kind of a finicky one uh, since we've improved a lot of the behavior here and you need to make some uh, additional considerations that maybe you weren't thinking about before. Uh, and then the image update automation uh, alpha, we've got a separate guide for that. Uh, no need to really look at these links or write them down. If you just go to the Flux website, again, like what I was mentioning, go to the migration section, make this bigger. So under migration, uh, there is a section about migrating from Helm operator and migrating from Flux V1 image update automation. And if you go into here, uh, you can see there's a long list of considerations about what you should know when you're tagging your images, uh, why things are more flexible, you know, why this thing was done, um, considerations for like rate limiting and things like that, uh, where to put image repositories, image policy, and image update automation manifests. Um, so those are the three types of objects that are necessary uh, when you kind of relate them to sources. And um, how to migrate, what to do. Uh, this migration guide uh, would also probably make more sense when you look in the guide section just for the image updates feature. So there's the migration section and then there's the guides. And we have an, just a full section on how this feature works in general. So how do you automate image updates to some source? And um, where is it? Yeah, so like here's an image repository definition. When you put one of these inside of your cluster, it's what tells Flux2 that you're opting into for that particular image, uh, fetching all of the tags. Uh, we don't do timestamp fetching either, uh, so that's why there's a whole migration uh, section on that. Uh, but we have more powerful strategies and pattern matching uh, that now work. Things like semver and uh, timestamp matching and things like that. 
Um, what else? Yeah, this is an image policy object. So this is the thing that actually then looks at the tag list that's pulled from an image repository and does sorting and figures out which one you're supposed to use. Um, so the sorting, you know, could be semver or alphanumeric or timestamp based. Uh, there's also regex parsing um, to grab the little bits and pieces that you need out of this. So you can create quite complex uh, compound policies. And then when any of those policies fire, then you're able to use this image update automation. And then we have an annotation uh, inside of the resources to tell Flux actually where to update that thing in place. So there's no more like annotation and label matching or annotation, like structural, like, uh, like structural heuristics inside of Flux to try and figure out where to update the tag. Uh, you simply annotate where you want that tag to be updated based off of the policy that fires. So it's a uh, pretty cool. I did a whole talk about uh, how this does work, um, but hopefully that's enough context on that particular question. Go ahead and check out the migration um, section for image updates, as well as how the feature works in the guide section. And, um, but yeah, I mean, uh, that's basically a migration for team A's application. Um, if you wanted to get a little bit into the manifest generation stuff, uh, you should just know that um, team A is just using plain manifests, right? But we still made a customization resource uh, in order to reconcile their manifests. Uh, and that's not actually using customize in any meaningful way to you. Uh, but you can use the customization uh, with Team B's resources to do the same thing, and you don't have to do any manifest generation to support that. Uh, so covers a pretty wide, wide use case there. Um, oh, Subramani, uh, micro, it's kind of like nano, um, except it's it's just a GoLang binary that's an editor. It's it's not related to micro -cates. It's a uh, yeah, I was just using it instead of VS Code. So Nano does that, and Micro uh, does this syntax highlighting. It's just a Go binary. It's a really cool thing. You should uh, check it out. Their website is Micro Editor FH, I think, or maybe is it IO Micro Editor <laughs> Micro Editor GitHub IO. Yeah. A modern and intuitive terminal based text editor. It's got split panes and themes and syntax highlighting and stuff like that. Mouse support. Uh, just a quick, you know, way to comfortably edit files in the terminal. It's got nice keyboard shortcuts that are like very similar to Windows keyboard shortcuts. So, uh, yeah. Um, Leon, Leon Kiefer. Sorry if I messed up your name. Uh, you, you're wondering, is the secret of the Git repository source generated by the Flux CLI also in the Git repository or is it only in Kubernetes? The answer is that the private key uh, of the SSH key pair, that lives only in Kubernetes. Uh, so that is this deploy key right here, Flux Git deploy. And uh, I could describe that for you and show which parts are in it. Flux Git deploy. Oh, sorry, no. Uh, team A app. Flux Git deploy is the old one. So I'll just show that for the purpose of migration. So this is the old one uh, that was built by Flux V1. It only has the private key in it, and then everything else is kind of inferred, and it doesn't have a known host. In Flux 2. Uh, we also keep the public key just for convenience in there, since there's no reason not to put it in there, even though it can be generated. And then the known host file for GitHub or whatever source you're pointing to is also here. Um, and that's yeah, just a nicety from using the uh, Flux CLI. And uh, so this is only living in Kubernetes, but then you take this part right here, the public key, uh, and you go into your repository deploy key settings. So team A is the repo here. You just go here and then you, you know, put that on there. So the public key, you tell GitHub, hey, when the cluster reaches out to me, you know, make sure that they're authenticated. Um, Alan 
Kastan Guai. Sorry if I messed up your name. Uh, the yeah, when I do like sleep six, and then like after a few seconds, then um, it's like printing how long the command took. Uh, this is coming from my prompt setup. It's a ZSH prompt called Presto uh, and Pure. Uh, so I use uh, Presto. The project is here, it's by Soren. And then once you install Presto, then the theme that I enable uh, is called Pure. So you, you end up doing like prompt and then Pure in here. And uh, that is in, in its own project by Cinder or Cindrezorus. So uh, whenever a command takes super long, then it like puts it over here. Similarly, you get like Git repo notifications and it runs asynchronously. It's pretty nice. So. You could also, uh, if you wanted a different approach, there's a project called Spaceship um, or Starship. Yeah, um, this is a Rust project that does a very similar thing. So you can see this is based off of Pure, and if something takes super long, it, it also puts the seconds there. Uh, Starship RS. I don't use that, but I've tried it out, and it's pretty nice and super fast. Cool. Um, yeah, lots of questions today. It's so wonderful to see all of you on. I hope I've provided uh, some value for you in the considerations uh, that you want to be making when you are migrating. Uh, from Flux v1 to Flux v2. Uh, Supermoney defaults access from the private key. I left it as read only, um, but you, that's just in control of how you add it to your Git repo. Um, it's a manual step that I took. Uh, if you use Bootstrap, it's also read only by default, but you can turn it into read write if you want. Um, but yeah. Value add on, um, you know, if you're a platform admin, if you're somebody on your dev team and you've been a Flux One advocate for a long time, uh, there are a lot of benefits uh, that you uh, may want to consider. If you're going to get value out of things like health checks and dependency ordering, if you want to start working with multiple repositories, um, then you should consider uh, maybe advocating moving from Flux V1 to Flux V2. Uh, we really want to build a strong documentation story uh, as well as a strong community of people who have done this migration. Um, so go ahead and, and check the toolkit uh, Flux CDIO website, our Flux 2 documentation. Uh, we've got a section on migrations as well as detailed guides about how all of the features work. Uh, in addition, we're going to be adding a use cases section here um, for the individual clouds and um, integrations with Vault, um, you know, uh, Flux from a Helm perspective, you know, all of that. So, uh, yeah, strong docs. Uh, please get involved, you know, uh, open up some discussions on GitHub, GitHub discussions. Check it out. And, uh, yeah, thanks so much for, for joining us. We hope that you will... Uh, Consider doing the migration. Uh, you know, stay plugged into the community, and um, yeah, let's let's build something cool together. Awesome. That's all I had to share. <laughs> Great. And if we didn't get to your questions, I noticed there were a bunch um, that were a little bit earlier on in the presentation. We'll follow up with an email, um, and you know, if we didn't didn't get to something, we'll go back and review those and uh, and and send you guys an email. So um, just a, a quick note to let you know. These are still happening every two weeks. Uh, here is the schedule for the upcoming dates. Uh, so March 22nd, we got Scott Rigby. He's gonna be talking about the uh, hands-on GitOps patterns for Helm users. This will also dive into a little bit of the Flux2 um, stuff. And uh, April 5th, Lee's coming back for some Azure, um, Flux2 on Azure <laughs> talk. Uh, and then we're going to be reviewing with Allison again on the Flux2 notifications, setting up notifications, alerts, and webhooks. So come back and join us for those. And we hope to see you uh, again in a couple of weeks. Thanks for stopping by, everybody. See you next time. <laughs>